Hello everyone and welcome to the Lost Wisdom of the Earth Telesummit. Now over the next 21 days you're going to get to meet a wonderful panel of speakers who will help you to explore just some of the many mysteries and wonders of this beautiful planet on which we live. I can promise you that your understanding of Mother Earth, Mother Nature, the reality we inhabit and the many, many levels of consciousness that make up our world is going to grow and expand tremendously as the various expert speakers from all around the world share their wisdom and knowledge with you. We live in extraordinary times and you will also gain clarity around what is unfolding at the moment. It's not just humanity, but everything, seen and unseen in our world, prepares for what is to come. So with no more ado, let's make a start. Now, my first guest is multi-talented. A successful astrologer, he has also studied and researched both the unconscious and the nature of human consciousness, and is a creative talent and musician. For many years, he's led private tours exploring the astronomy and cultural history of some of the most sacred landscapes in the world. Stonehenge and Avebury in the UK are known worldwide. And to introduce us to these sites and explore some of what we understand about them is David Charles Rowan. David, welcome. Hello. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, first and foremost, um, you live actually near one of these sites, don't you? Can you tell us a little about that? Yeah, I, I live within the Avebury World Heritage Site. Um, uh, in the Avebury landscape, there's an enigma called Silbury Hill, which for when you first look at it, it looks like a pyramid. Um, although it's densely packed with peat and chalk, it hasn't got anything inside it. Um, and I'm looking at it right now from my office window. There's a, a powerful ley line that runs from Silbury right through, well, through the very chair that I'm sitting on. And uh, I live, breathe, and sleep in this fabulous place. But I've lived around this area for 30 years, um, almost like spiraling into its heart. And uh, that's kind of where I feel I'm embraced now. Well, you're obviously, from um, what you're saying, you're very much a part of that landscape. Mm. So do you want to start by sort of telling us um, something about how long ago um, the, these sites were in use and, and what we understand about them? And then I, I, um, you, you know a lot about archaeoastrology as well, and I'm hoping you're going to tell us something about um, these sites in relation to that. Yes. Well, OK, just to start uh, then. Um, as you know, uh, the field of exploring history is called archaeology, and archaeologists look at the ground. And the field of exploring the heavens um, used to be unified in terms of uh, giving the heavens meaning, and it was called astral logos, or knowledge of the heavens. And that was divided in around the 15th, 16th centuries into astrology, attributing meaning to the sky, but astronomy, observing and notating and understanding the sky. Uh, in 1965, a chap called Gerald Hawking wrote a book called Stonehenge Decoded, and he was one of the first people to look at the sky and the ground together in relationship to one another. And that gave birth to a new discipline where people began to revise what we understand about sacred sites, but with reference to the sky at the time. And they didn't want to call it... Um, astrological archaeology because it would have the word astrology in it and they didn't mm. like that. <laughs> so they called it archaeoastronomy. Mm. And what I mean by the sky at the time is that um, the earth doesn't have a fixed point as it revolves around the sun. It has an elliptical orbit. So if you think of a gyroscope pattern or the kind of pattern that an, an atom traces around the, you know, the nucleus of a, a particle might trace around the nucleus of an atom, um, you get this kind of almost like sketchograph kind of imagery and uh, if you could mark in space with an indelible marker where the earth was at a particular point and go bruh, 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 and it kind of fixes it would take a roughly 25,000 years for the earth to return to exactly the same spot and that's called the great year yeah. and if you divide that into 12 sections you get rough periods of time of around 2,000 years which is where we get the idea of ages from yeah age of Aquarius etc so um, 
uh, the vernal equinox, when the hours of daylight equal the hours of night, if you could cast a, a ruler out into space, not through the tropical zodiac that astrologers look at, but into the constellation of stars, at the moment it would go through the, the constellation of Aquarius. Mm. 2,000 years ago it went through the constellation of Pisces, 2,000 years before that through the constellation of Aries. And that's called... That's so this, called, this is where we get the age of Aquarius from. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's coming uh, into the age of Aquarius. Yeah. So, mm. so it's called the procession of the equinoxes, mm. which means that when you look at ancient sites, the heavens look slightly different to them. So computer technology allows us to rewind the solar system and fast forward the solar system ad infinitum, because it's just calculus. And so that means that since the advent of you know, portable computing around the end of the 80s, early 90s, um, that archaeoastronomy began to blossom because people could look at ancient sites with reference to the sky as it was at the time of building. Yeah. And so an alignment that fits today wouldn't have been in the intention before. Um, an alignment that fitted before would be out of kilter now. Yeah. Hmm. And so um, this, is, this means that we can kind of review um, possibly some of the culture, possibly some of the ideas that might have been behind some of these, uh, you know, great temples and things that stood the test of time. Okay, well, let's, let's start with Stonehenge, because that's the one that, that is probably the most famous. Mm -hmm. um, using uh, that knowledge and understanding, what, what is that showing us about Stonehenge, if anything? It actually makes more sense to start at Avebury. Does it? <laughs> okay, yeah. we'll start and, at Avebury and, then. And the reason is that, that Avebury precedes Stonehenge. It's earlier in the yeah. story. Um, uh, when I do my tours, I, I often describe, describe it a bit like this. Um, we're very used to navigating space. Yeah. You know, we say excuse me as we go through doorways, we kind of mind how we park in car parks and things like this. So we're constantly in a, in a frame of being conscious about how we move through space. Mm. We're kind of less conscious about how we move through time. And what I mean by that is that we understand what clothes to wear. We understand what we're going to do based on the context of our reference in time. So, you know, there's one time of year when it's appropriate to wear shorts and a thin T-shirt. Yeah. There's another time of year when it, that's not appropriate to do that. So in order to know whether or not you should put on a heavy coat or your shorts, you need to know what season you're in, which means you need to know when you are in time. Yeah. So, and we're used to there being a structure. So there's, I don't know, Christmas and then New Year's Eve, then Easter, then at some point your birthday, and then bonfire night and the next thing, you know. Mm, yeah. But could you imagine what it would be like if you didn't have that? If you didn't have that, you'd notice that there is a pattern, there's a rhythm. Uh, mm. The trees go orange. Yep. And when the trees go orange, all the birds disappear. Yep. The fish disappear from the rivers. So you don't know where they go. The ground goes hard. Some of the animals run away. Different animals come in. Different birds come in. And then the ground goes rock solid, and you can't do anything with it. Yeah. But then if you don't know how long that's going to last, you don't know whether or not your grain store, you can eat it all quickly, or yeah. you've got to eke it, eke it out with meager amounts. Mm. Because you'd be unable to tell when the ground's going to go soft again. Mm. All you know is it's hard again, it's hard again, it's hard again. And when our ancestors came down from the canopy, and we kind of you know, went through jungles and walked out across savannic plains, Human beings can't really fight off a predator. You know, we've got very ineffective teeth and tiny claws. So the only way that we could outwit a predator was to develop these brilliant frontal lobes, which are probably the most powerful weapon in the animal kingdom, and have the ability to outsmart a predator by predicting many steps ahead. So that meant that our ancestors survived because of their ability to anticipate things. Right? Yeah. So hu human beings are wired to, to understand themselves as a creature embedded in time. So if you, if you I mean, one of my master's degrees is in psychosocial studies. And for my dissertation, I was researching consciousness and things. Mm. And if you look at consciousness from an academic perspective, one of the definitions is a sense of self embedded in a narrative of, an, of a biography. Mm. So we can understand ourselves in terms of, 
the relationship we have with here and now, but that's in the context of our past. So if you didn't have a memory of your history, mm. you wouldn't know what your name is. You wouldn't even know what a name is. Yeah. You know, so we can only understand what we're doing because we remember something from our history. Even that's, if that's our name, we understand days of the week. We understand the idea of clothes, right? Yeah. So, we don't tend to think about this, do we? But we are set within a story. Yeah. Indeed, yeah. Mm. So, so we have a sense of present context with reference to a biographical history, mm. but also with reference to an anticipated future trajectory. So we make decisions about what we're doing now based on what we want to unfold. Yeah. Yeah. So you yep. begin to cook your dinner because you have an idea that eating food is going to happen further ahead in time. Yes. But you know that what you're doing in a kitchen with hot ovens and things is appropriate. Right. Yep. Right. So um, our ancestors then would have been kind of uh, very strongly inclined to want to get a handle on time. Yeah. So different cultures have had different relationships with trying to do this. I think in uh, it's either the Pyrenees or the Andes, um, up a, a mountainside, there are large clumps of stones piled in massive uh, heaps mm. that coincide with movements of the sun as it moves across the landscape. So if you look at your garden fence, for example, through the year, you'll find that at one time of the year, the sun will come up at one point in the garden fence. Mm. And as you get towards the summer solstice, it moves along and then it moves back again. Yeah. So being able to mark time was an important thing. And within Avebury, uh, at the moment, what people see is kind of like, you know, the embellished Avebury. There's yeah. an avenue, there's a bank and ditch, uh, which is lined with stones. There are two, what appear to be two inner circles inside it. And there was another avenue that's no longer to be found, but it was sketched by a man called William yeah. Stigley in the 17th century. Can I, for, for all of those people uh, who are watching who are not aware of Avery, I mean, you can look it up on the internet and you can see a picture of it on the internet very easily. But yeah. it's huge, isn't it? It is so huge that there's actually a village inside it, yeah. a village that was built inside it. Indeed. Avery mm. is the largest stone circle in Europe. It has a village in it. It has a road going through it, and American tourists, when I do my tours, say, why is there a road going through the village? Well, uh, if you look at Avery from the air, it, it, it actually looks like an equal arm cross, like a Celtic yeah. cross. Yeah. You find that those cross points are almost compass aligned. Right. Which, yes, some kind of ceremonial trackway would have been in existence as a part of the site itself. Yeah. And if you, in the 13th century, in the 12th century, if you wanted to travel from devices to Swindon for some reason, you've got a choice. Uh, you can go across the flat plain, or you can go along the high ridges and go up and down hills going puff and pound, puff and pound. <laughs> yeah. So it's much easier to go along the valley floor. Early, early gym. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And so whereas modern cities are all built on grid systems mm. and space, in Britain we have meandering paths, possibly because a rabbit goes around the, 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 the muddy hole and then a human comes along and follows the rabbit track, and then someone gets a cart and horse, and they go around the muddy track, and then someone invents tarmac, and you get the A360. Yes. Right? Mm. So, so the road is possibly following a trackway that would have been in existence before, which could have been part of the ceremonial pattern. Yeah. So that's why the road goes through. The reason the village is there is that Avery fell into disuse. Um, by around the ninth century, uh, the, uh, the Saxons brought Christianity into Avebury. There's mm. actually a very rich Christian heritage there. If Christian history is of your interest, mm. uh, you'll find that there was, you know, there was rebellion against the burning of monasteries and all sorts of things in Avebury. Um, but Avebury, as a as a pagan temple, fell into disuse by around the ninth century. Um, there was one of the great burnings in the thirteenth century. Um, the, the landowner at the time decided that anything heathen was prefixed with the word devil. So mm -hmm. devil's dyke, devil's chair, devil's moat, etc. Um, there was another trashing uh, in Cromwellian times. And so by around the, the turn of the 20th century, Avery was essentially a quintessential kind of village. Yeah. There was a school, um, you know, there was a local shop, and mm -hmm. there was a postal service, and that was it. But there was a, a family called Keeler who were big in marmalade. That didn't mean that they grow like, you know, giants in marmalade. That meant that they were, you know, fortunes. Yes. 
the world of marmalade. And they had a son called Alexander. And he became very interested in the history of the place. Mm. So he almost did like a cultural cleansing. He purchased a lot of the houses in the middle of the, of the circle, um, built another village about two miles away or less than two miles away, mm. had all the residents move out to the new village and then destroyed the houses and started to return every or restore it to its original form. So they started to resurrect stones. The world wars got in the way. Mm. So by about 1951, a World Heritage uh, pr uh, Preservation Order was slapped on the place. So now you have this strange geographical space where there's a quintessential English village mixed in with a World Heritage site, mixed in with a pagan temple, mixed in with all these archaeologists and people wearing white robes coming in occasionally. <laughs> 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 and it's 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 a very interesting place from a sociological perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So so Avery essentially from the air looks like a circle with an equal arm cross. It looks like in the northern circle there's a little mini circle, and mm. it looks like in the south there's another mini circle. Mm. Um, I was taken around there. Uh, there's a conference called INSAP, which is the Inspiration of Astronomical Phenomena. And every two or three years, scientists, particle physicists, artists, poets, astrologers, and astronomers get together for a week. That's quite a mix. It is. And they talk about what the cosmos means to them. Mm. So it's literally left brain, right brain meeting together with a sense of dignity and harmony and respect. So you will have one lecture where someone, an artist will talk about how he's inspired by curved light. And then the next one will be someone from Arizona University talking about his job of scanning the universe for life on other, in other form mm. and, and so on. Um, it's, it's just an incredible thing to be part of that. And we had a talk by uh, Mike Pitts, who is now editor of Archaeology magazine, and he mentioned a stone that could be used as an eclipse predictor. All right. And this was picked up on by a lady called Marie Wheatley, who was one of my students a long while ago. Um, and she published uh, a photograph of the moon up over, one, over this particular stone. So it looks like that stone could have been used as an eclipse predictor. There, there's a, a cycle of the moon called the Metonic Cycle, which is 18.6 years. And it's important for you to remember that. Remember, <laughs> remember 18.6 years, a Metonic Cycle. But the problem with this particular stone is it's a relationship rather than alignment. So you need more than two objects to make an alignment. Mm. If you just have two things, that's a relationship. You can step to the left, you can step to the right, mm. and it will look different. Whereas yeah. if you have three or more points, then you have an alignment. Yeah. So if the moon appears behind your garden fence and you, it looks to you as if it's rising up above a post, if you step to the right, it won't. If you step to the left, it won't. It will only look like it's rising above a post if you stand in a certain place. And that's yeah. inaccurate. So it looks like in early Avebury, there was an eclipse predictor, albeit not very accurate. Meanwhile, in the southern part of Avebury, there's a circle that's a strange shape. It's actually not quite a circle. It's got a kind of an elongated side. And uh, the brilliantly uh, visionary Marie Wheatley noticed that when the sun comes up on the, the eastern bank, mm. when it hits one of the large stones, it casts a shadow line, which then touches other stones out in front of it. And it actually works as a seasonal kind of sundial. Mm. Yeah. There was an, a bank and ditch that's around Avebury now. There was a smaller one in its earlier heyday. Mm. So it seems as if there was kind of AFB1 and then AFB2. Yeah. All right. Now. So, so when you say AFB1 and AFB2, we're talking about different periods in time. Periods of time. A little bit like, you know, you had the wooden Londinium and then now you've got a gherkin, right? The same geographical space kind of evolves through culture, evolves through, through epoch of time. Yeah. Uh, there's another part to this which kind of creates a new narrative of Avery, and that is, this is strange, but go with it, right? Mm. The word henge comes from the folk notion of hanging stones. So when you look at Stonehenge, you know you've got the lintel across the top and then the stones holding them up, right? Yeah. 
So you could look at that as if upright stones hold a lintel across the top, a horizontal stone yeah. across the top. Or you could look at it that there's a levitating horizontal stones and the other stones hang down. Right, yeah, yeah. Hence, hanging stones, right? Mm. So hinge means hanging stones. And there's only one in the world. That's our beloved Stonehenge, right? However, only one. Yeah, that's the only place in the world where you've got uprights with lintels going across in a that complete a circle. Right. Right. Yeah. No one else anywhere has done that. However, at Stonehenge, uh, there's a, a bank and a ditch. And at Avebury, there's a bank and a ditch. But mm. the one at Stonehenge has the ditch on the outside with the bank on the inside. Whereas at Avebury, you've got the ditch on the inside with the bank on the outside. So it's the, the direct opposite. Indeed. And in the world of archaeology, if you have a bank, a ditch on the inside with a bank on the outside, that's called a henge. So the official name of Avebury in the archaeological world is Avebury Henge. Yeah. So Stanton, Drew, Castlebrick, etc. They're all henges, right? Because mm. they have the bank on the outside with the ditch on the inside. But Stonehenge is the other way around. So in the world of archaeology, Stonehenge isn't the henge. I mean, that's bizarre, isn't it? <laughs> it's surely Stonehenge is the henge. The and henge. It's a pseudo bank ditch affairs, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is just so weird. Anyway, so um, uh, I, I, I go to conferences and things, and I try to keep up with the latest ideas. And th there was uh, uh, the professor that ran the Riverside project that was done in the Stonehenge area between 2003 2010, mm. Mike Parker Pearson. And uh, I had the, the fortune to sit next to him at a little mini conference at Oxford University in uh, 2015. And he said that um, the, the notion now is that when you have a ditch on the inside with a bank on the outside, that's to keep something out. Whereas yeah. the ditch and that bank orientate the other way around, like at Stonehenge, is to keep something in. Yeah, yeah. There's so there's no logical sense to that. Indeed. So they're now starting to look at all hinges as being sealed off or closed down or shut down. So the carbon dating of Avebury, which comes from the bank and ditch of 3200 BC, isn't the date of when it began. It's the right. date when it ended. Right, because I was going to ask you if, if yeah. you thought that that dating was at all well, accurate. Where the, where the problem is with, is, is with what uh, could be described as the badger effect. Yeah. It, you can't carbon date rock, right, because yep. rock is as old as the earth. Yeah. Uh, you can only or, or carbon date the organic matter around rock. So, mm. so if a badger lies down next to a stone and dies, 3,000 years later, someone kind of finds some organic material, and what you're, what you're carbon dating is the badger. Yeah. Right. Now, when you plonk a stone somewhere, you do get spores sometimes trapped underneath, like, you know, viruses, spores, yeah. Sort of yeah. things. And, and that might enable you to be able to carbon date that, but that means getting to the bottom. So Pearson said, you know, what we want to do, he said, is, is we want to excavate and see what's underneath the bank and ditch Avery. Um, but there's no way that the local groups would allow that. Yeah. The villagers would be upset. Um, the, the esoteric community that revere Avebury would mm. be upset. Um, not only that, but when they did the Riverside project, mm. uh, they got about £2 million worth of funding. And so far, there's only one book. But they, yeah, got, right. they got thousands of bits of material from it. But you've got to sift and sort it all to make sense of it. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be a long time before they can apply for more funding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, or kind of find out what's underneath Avebury. Mm. This is this is ringing, um, you know, some bells in my mind um, in relationship to Gebekli Tepe. Do you know? No. Uh, Gebekli Tepe is it's a site in in Turkey, uh, and there are tea stones there, not not the hanging stones, the lintels, but the tea stones. Uh, and it's a huge site, and they've only um, uncovered a, a, a part of it, and they think it's probably one of the oldest sites ever from the dating that they've done. But it was covered in. Mm. It was very, very deliberately this huge, huge site of all of these sort of standing stone circles, and all sorts of them, mm. was actually covered in until it looked like a hill. Ah. So, 
yeah so so i mean it was like a pot-bellied hill and that's what the locals called it and it wasn't until an archaeologist came along and started digging and started finding this that they realized that everything there these huge huge stones had been deliberately covered over mm. they think it had been in use about two thousand years and then hidden mm. and and from what you're saying i mean it's ringing some sort of bell to do with the fact that you think the the end stage as it were of avebury they were trying to surround it protect it mm. whatever yeah well um if you uh look at the the the, the kind of the ceremonial and funeral disposition mm. and, and the belief system of the people of what might be described as A B one. Yeah. Uh, they they built long barrows, mm. multi chamber burial chambers. There's one called West Kennet, which is just over the hill from my office window. Yeah. It's the <laughs> largest one in, in the country and you can actually go inside it. Mm. Or at least you can go inside the, the first part of its entrance. And there is debate about it. It's east west aligned. Mm. Uh, some people say that it would have had a letterbox opening like Newgrange on the banks of the River Boyne. Do you know about that? In Ireland, yes. Yeah, yeah. And so it's got what's called, a, a, it has a sealed entrance and it has a letterbox opening. And on midwinter's day, as the sun rises, it shines, it touches the letterbox opening and it illuminates the entire chamber for about seven minutes and then that's it. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. It is. There, there, there's a 35 year waiting list to see it. Wow. <laughs> you too hired it for the millennium, so, you know. Yeah, well, <laughs> but with West Kennet Longbarrow, it has an open entrance. Mm. And so some people say that's an archaeological uh, uh, mis mistake, that, you know, in a restoration moment, the stones were rearranged and it should be closed with the letterbox opening. But the, the historian Neil Oliver has a completely different notion. Mm. He thinks that it would have been built as an open thing. Yeah. When you go in there, there are little kind of um, enclaves. So it might make you think of the Valley of the Kings, where there's yeah. a priestess in one place and a priest in another, a mm. priest in another. But the, the latest notion is that that's not the case at all. What would have happened is that when you leave life, your body is put out on a briar or it's just left out in the open. Mm. Birds and insects peck all your flesh away, so you're just skeletal. Yeah. And then your skeleton is broken up into pieces. So there'd be a room of feet, a room of shoulders, a room of elbows, a room of jaws. Yeah. Because when you are alive, you are an identity, an individual. Yeah. But when you die, you enter the land of the ancestors. Mm. And you're a community. You're no longer an individual anymore. Mm. And if West Kennet Long Barrel was open, then you could walk in and commune with the ancestors and be at one with them. Yeah. And from what, what we think we understand, the ancestors we would appear to be an important part or ancestor worship or yeah, in, an in important that, part of ancient... Yeah, in that culture, yeah. yeah. But when they shut down Avebury and went 20 miles south and did something far more elaborate, right? Mm. About 400 years later, some new people came in and they had tattoos and they had inlaid jewellery and they wanted their burials to be on their own with mm. their arrowheads and beakers and things. Right? Yeah. So if you were astrologically proficient, you might say that AB1 was designed and built by Aquarians and then a load of Leos moved in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. So it's all about me. And we've got our way of doing yeah. things. <laughs> yeah. and, and, the, and these new bling people that came in, they're the ones that create the bigger, you know, the, the, the stones lining around everything. They put the avenues in place. Uh, they grabbed all these rocks from uh, seven miles away and dragged them over undulating hills and put them out in places. Uh, there's also, then, if you go south 20 miles, mm. you find yourself in the Stonehenge landscape. Uh, there's a place uh, that's about two miles from Stonehenge where they found uh, a henge, i.e. Yeah. back and ditch, circular, yeah. only very slightly smaller than Avebury. And when they started to have a look at it in around 2003, 2004, they found a thousand houses. A thousand? Yeah, this is a place called Durrington Walls. And the expectation would have been that the houses would be round, like Celtic roundhouses, but they're yeah. actually square. And they're the same architectural design as Scarabray and the things that were happening in the Orkneys. 
Mm, which is the other end, for those who don't know Britain very well, it's yeah, right north, the other end. north of Scotland, yeah. Like, like go, going off into the sea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so what was happening up in the Orkneys predates uh, what was happening at Darlington Moors by about 400 years. Yeah. So it seems as if some architectural ideas migrated and came south. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When they started exploring, uh, I stumbled on the site and I found, uh, if for anyone who's interested, if you really want to know about archaeology, there's something about archaeologists that's useful to know, and that is their families are bored witless by what they have to say. <laughs> if someone comes home from work and says, oh, hello, dear, yeah, we've found some Iron Age pottery. It's very interesting. Right? And they say, yes, dear, here's your soup. And she's just not listening. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 more so, pottery. <laughs> so, so an archaeologist finds themselves in the face of someone who's going, so what you got? When they meet enthusiasm, they just tell you everything, right? <laughs> so you can kind of just gate crash an archaeological site. Mm. So what are you doing? What you found? And if you sound like you know a little bit, you know, don't mm. talk, right? And yeah. you can learn a lot. <laughs> <As a lady. laughs> it's worth knowing. Yeah. <laughs> Next so, time I meet an archaeologist. <laughs> yeah, so, so I was doing like one of my mini tours uh, for a friend of mine. And we stumbled on this site and we said, oh, what's happening? Next thing, they took us into the, their cabins. Mm -hmm. They showed us, you know, the array of findings they had. They gave us a guided tour of everything. And, uh, you know, at one point, uh, Pearson said, oh, you know, and they, they, there were these round holes, which were about, uh, about, I don't know, maybe 10 inches in diameter and about ooh, four feet deep, like tubes in the ground. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, what are those? He said, oh, they're Iron Age, like they're irrelevant, right? <laughs> Mm. They said for the Neolithic and Paleolithic, maybe, but, mm. it, but they looked and they did that. And I said, well, what were they? And they said, grain stores. I said, grain stores. And apparently what they used to do was pack oats into a tube in the ground, right, and then set light to the top of it. Yeah. And, it and, and, and it caramelizes. Okay. And it creates a seal, and it keeps the oats fresh for up to 10 months. Oh, wow. Yeah, so they would just just dig this tube yeah. into the ground. Yeah, yeah, and then pack, pack it pack it with the harvest, and then set light to the top of it. Yeah, how clever. Yeah, but who? I mean, someone must have. Who I, that? I, yeah. yeah. It's over their porridge in the morning. Yeah, but, yeah. Oh, my porridge is. Oh, hold on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's not wasted porridge. <laughs> yeah, I thought. I thought. I thought that was fantastic. Yeah. But that wasn't, he was pointing out, you know, there was a half here and there was a thing there. And they, they kind of built up this, this picture. And what they found was um, uh, there were lots of bones from different animals and things. And in, at that time, flora and fauna hadn't migrated around that much. Mm. So that's how they know that one of the bodies they found in a nearby round barrow was from um, the Alps. You know, yeah. the famous Avery, Amesbury Archer. So by looking at the isotopes in the teeth of cattle, they could tell where the cattle were eating their food. Mm. There were cows at Durrington that had been walked from Scotland. Walked from Scotland? Walked from Scotland. In now, why would you do that? I mean, walk I mean that's kind of like making life difficult. Well, indeed. Um, but, but there's no roads, remember? Yeah, Every, absolutely. Muddy, muddy tracks if you're lucky. No, no tracks. Everything mm. was thick forest from, yeah. you know, from, the, from one side of the country to the other. Um, there, were, there were wolves, there were bears, there were big cats, indigenous creatures, mm. right? and marauding bandits, and the trackways were the rivers. So to walk your cows in Scotland, that's an astonishing thing to do. And they also found cows from uh, Kent and Cornwall as well. Yeah. But it also, I mean, it also sort of begs the, it begs the question, doesn't it? Why? So what is there in this land well, pulling people? When they, when they looked at the arrowheads, they found different quantities of arrowhead. Mm. There were ones that seemed like master craftsmen, ones that seemed sort of iffy, and others were like really shoddy. Mm. So it seems as if this area was a kind of a meeting point for people, almost like the Glastonbury of its day, if you yeah. like. Hmm. And they don't know whether or not the population would have lived there all year, but there was certainly enough housing to kind of house almost the entire population of the island in its time. So there was, it was like a, they think it was like a nice Steadford. It was all sorts of things, but they also found. Uh, that and was, I, I Steadford again, for, for those who aren't familiar with our British uh, customs. Yeah. <laughs> so a, a grand kind of, um, 
uh, a get together, a party. <laughs> a party, but also a kind of um, uh, what, what we might. You well, it's a cultural a, a, a talent contest of poetry, mm -hmm. and music, and and the arts, and and yeah. exhibitions of artistic things. And you can only have that if you have an organised society anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, so when, when Caesar came over and said the Britons are barbarians, my teacher at school taught me that that meant the British were savages. Yeah. But the word barbarian in Roman culture meant anyone who wasn't Roman. Yeah. So it's the same way that you're either a Christian or a heretic or a Gentile or a Jew or you're a you know, Muslim or an infidel, you're a Roman or you're you know, a barbarian. Yeah. So that didn't mean that we were savage. It just meant we were different. Yes. And I, I talk about this with someone later on in the summit, actually. We talk about the Druids and, and what high esteem they were held in. Indeed. All over the world, the, the known world at that time, people mm. traveled to these isles to mm. study with them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But they, 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 they weren't, again, they weren't the, um, you know, the con cannibal savages that, that, that um, Roman propaganda tries to make them out to be. Well, actually, Roman propaganda didn't. It was my teacher's misunderstanding of the word barbarian. Yeah. My teacher mm. taught me that. He taught me <laughs> that, 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 that the ancient Britons were like Arnold Schwarzenegger in a band movie, right? <laughs> <laughs> because he didn't understand Roman culture enough to understand yeah. it just meant different. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. He told me, the, told me the ancients thought the world was flat as well, which was completely wrong. But anyway. <laughs> so, so don't believe anything you learned at school we spend well, our lives unpicking it don't we yeah so anyway um so it seems that there was this kind of gathering thing and um in when i did pagan training through my 20s mm. i was at a very early kind of um pagan meeting at a time that we call beltane which is the beginning of summer first of may mm. at, yeah around that time mm. and someone said you know when is beltane so someone said the first of May, which is interesting. But then someone else said, yeah, in the Gregorian calendar, but in the Julian calendar, that would be a 12-day difference because mm. in the 15th century, 12 days were taken out of the calendar. There were rights in Lincoln and York because yeah. people thought the king had stolen 12 days of their lives. Yeah. If you put the 12 days back in, uh, you find that Morris dancers still dance on the 13th of May, which is the traditional bell mm. Um If you think of the 31st of October as being the the festival of remembering the dead mm. Mm. all hallows if you add the 12 days on it takes you to the 11th of november which is still remembrance day yes yeah and the the second of february the original in bog you add the 12 days it takes you to the 14th of february which is valentine's yeah yeah mm. that might even reveal why somehow there are 12 days of christmas rather than one yeah absolutely and that mm. also lets you know why the signs of the zodiac change their dates at an odd time of the month rather than mm. the first, which would be convenient because yeah. it's a twelve day shift. So yeah. um if you because of that, um and, and uh, this thing, someone said the twelfth, someone said the, th the first of May, um, and then another voice piped up, Well, you know, if the white form isn't blooming, it's not Beltane, how can you have Beltane without the goddess? The white the white form being being head Yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, or a revered uh, herb. And so then someone else said, of course, you know, a 13th century pedant wouldn't have a calendar on the wall. They'd, they'd follow the seasons by looking out of the window. Yeah, Mother Nature. Yeah, indeed. Now, contemporary humans have notions that there's a late spring or an early summer, which is impossible. Mm. What happens is that the, the seasons flowing the way they do, human beings have expectations which are out of kilter with the nature. Yeah. And we say that things are late or early, but it's our inability to calculate. Mm. Which is why, you know, every four years, people think that the planets go, e -yup, and they have a leap. But they don't. It's, there's a readjustment to Canada because our Canada is out of sync with the celestial sphere. Yeah. So we have to readdress it. Right? Mm. So uh, then you, now you have a choice. Uh, do you go with the Gregorian Canada for Beltane, 1st of May, the Junian Canada for Beltane, 13th of May, or do you look out the window and assume that the flora and fauna know better whether mm. it's warmer or not. Yeah. And I kind of figured that the flora and fauna get their signals from the sun and the moon in a dance in relationship with the earth. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I created a solar lunar perpetual calendar so I could predict seasons ahead of time by looking at the dance between the sun, the moon, and the earth. Yeah. Mm. And it seemed to me that, that Yule or winter's longest night 
would be the moment that the Canada would restart. Yeah. Mm. And I thought, you know, I was a lone voice, really. Everyone's going, summer solstice, summer solstice, summer solstice. And I'm thinking, ah, winter, winter, winter. Yeah, yeah. And the other way around. Until I saw a historian on TV called Adam Hart Davis. And he used to do these little 10-minute little vignettes of history, like what the Romans done for us. Mm. For us. And he was at Woodhenge. And he said that he believed that the orientation of Woodhenge wasn't for the summer solstice. It was for the winter. Yeah. Now, mm. If you think of an axis, the, the axis of the uh, midwinter sunset mm. is the same axis as the midsummer sunrise. So although something might be solstitially aligned, mm. you don't know whether it's in, its ceremonial purpose was intended to be summer or winter. All you know is it's, so, is it's solstitially yeah. aligned, mm. but which end of the thing? And what they found at Durrington was loads and loads of cremation remains, but they were cremation remains of pigs. Yeah. And they could tell from the cremation remains uh, how big the muscles were. And from that, they could tell how big the creature was. And from that, they could tell how old the creature was. And that meant they could tell what time of year. Mm. And all these cremation remains were from midwinter. Right. Mm. So they formed this notion, a wild notion, that if Aunt Flo died in March, for example, you'd put her out on a briar or let the birds peck her from the ground and then gather her bones and put them in a, some kind of bag or sack or something made of skin and wait. And mm. then midwinter, you'd go to the place and you'd have the great burning. And at the great burning, the cremation remains of Aunt Flo would be gathered. And then you'd process her along the River Avon and then the River Avon intersects with the Stonehenge Avenue. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and then, so she leaves the land of the living at Durrington and then enters the land of the ancestors. Mm -hmm. the so they went to have a look and see, you know, is there something here that points to this? And they found another henge. <laughs> you just have to know where to look. <laughs> it, it, yeah. So it seems as if the entire scope of the World Heritage Site not just Stonehenge itself, but about a two-mile radius around it. All of that is Stonehenge. Right, yeah. And, and it's, so a it's, a lot, it's a lot bigger than we actually... Indeed, yeah. So it yeah. seems as if it's, at the very least, a ceremonial landscape. Now, Stonehenge itself it was built over 1,500 years in different stages. And stage one was merely the, the ditch and bank, the famous thing we know now, right? Um, and it had uh, a man called Aubrey in 1664, something like that. Uh, he found uh, some holes. There were 28 holes mm. around it at equidistant points. His name was John Aubrey. Mm. So there they're called the Aubrey Holes. Now, there are 56, which is two times 18, which yep. is the tonic cycle. Remember that from the eclipse? Thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. So if you get um, some two sticks and you mark the phases of the moon, you'll get 28 points. Yeah. Yeah, and if you make, if you make a lunar calendar of your 28 points, uh, you'll get a lunation calendar that's about 97% accurate for three months. Mm. But if you double the amount of points, right, uh, then you get a calendar that's 99% accurate. If you move one stick for the sun and one stick for the moon in one direction, there's a... We know, of course, that we go round the sun. Mm. It looks to us as if the sun goes round us. We mm. know it. It's called the ecliptic, and it's the sun's apparent path through the sky. And, and it is apparent. It means it's, yeah. just, it's not physical, right? It's conceptual. But twice a day, the moon crosses the ecliptic in the northern hemisphere of the Earth and in the southern hemisphere of the Earth. Mm. We now call them the nodes of the moon, the north node and the south node. In ancient texts, they were called the head and the tail of the dragon. Yeah. So the dragon being uh, that, that just the, the way the, when the moon crosses the sun's yeah. path, right? Mm. So if you have sticks moving in one direction for the sun and the moon, but every three days move a stick in the other direction for the node of the moon, when the sticks meet, there's an eclipse. Yeah, right. So uh, now, if you uh take the notion that instead of the seasons being you know it's the equinox on sunday right well and, the, the day that this is going yeah, out mm. yeah 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 indeed and the americans 
and a lot of contemporary weather people would say it's the beginning of autumn but pagans wouldn't <laughs> i wouldn't either <laughs> it's definitely been autumn out there for quite some time it, indeed yeah so mm. so in paganism uh the beginning of winter uh, sorry the beginning of spring takes place when you get snowdrops yeah right? and that's in early february yeah uh summer begins at Beltane. yeah autumn begins at mammoth around the beginning of august yeah and winter begins at, at Samhain, which is the end of October. October. So, mm. that's, so that marks the beginnings of seasons. Now, yeah, it's what, it's what I call in, in the, the tradition I work with, it's the gateway into the seasons. Yeah, yeah, you could also call them the fire festivals, the mm. Sabbaths, and, and in archaeology they're called the, the, the quarters. Yes. So if you mark these quarters with shadow alignments of sun and moon, you can draw a, 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 an oblong box. Mm. Now, if you draw that oblong box of your shadow lines for the beginning of spring, summer, etc., on the solstice, the line of the alignment of the sun, whether it's winter or summer, would be absolutely perpendicular to the oblong, hmm. but only at 51 degrees north. If you move it 52 degrees north, it doesn't work. So if you go north of Oxford, it doesn't work. If you go into Cornwall, it's too far south, it doesn't work. It only works at 51 degrees north. So these sites are absolutely perfectly placed for this. Indeed, yeah. I saw a lecture. Well, fancy from, that. <laughs> I saw a lecture from a Russian, by a Russian uh, archaeoastronomer. Mm. And uh, his slides were so good, we could follow him without even hardly any of his words. Yeah. And, and he said that 80% of all ancient sites are at 51 or 52 degrees north around the planet. Wow. Which is like, whoa. So that, that, that but, is immediately saying that our forebears knew something. They worked with both the heavens and the earth in a yeah. way that we really... Indeed. It's taken us a long time and a lot of science to figure this out. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and so um, it seems that uh, if, you, if you mark these four corners, then mm. from that, using shadow lines, you can mark seasons. Yeah. And at Stonehenge there are things called station stones in amongst the aubrey holes which form the oblong mm -hmm. so if you could imagine stonehenge with the stones missing just yeah. from there what you've got left is a ditch and bank mm. these 50, four, 56 holes and these four quarter points that's all you need with that you have a perfect calendar mm. that would last for about a thousand years because the procession of the equinoxes would mean it it can't be moved it you know i think herschel was the first person to put a telescope on a rolling thing mm. <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes yeah. fancy moving stonehenge every every well, indeed pick it up yeah so <laughs> so it's got a shelf life because it's made of stone but that's their medium you know i mean the same intellect that we put into modern phenomena like polymers and electricity they were putting into stone yeah you know it's their nasa right mm. So then the next question is, what are all these big stones for? Because they're unnecessary in terms of Stonehenge as calendrical. Yeah. So uh, it, when I do my tours, quite often uh, I used to give uh, the, the ladies kind of a, a jute bag with Stonehenge and men on the side. And I give the guys a little kind of guidebook thing about Stonehenge alignments. Right? And I ran out one year. I thought, oh, no, I've ran out of the alignment books. And then I couldn't remember what, what, what it was. So I looked at Amazon, and there's half a dozen of these things, right? Mm. And I thought, oh, I don't know which one is what. So I bought about three of them just to, to have a look a, about a, a week before a tour. So I got the post, and I looked at this thing. And it, it wasn't a book I'd recognized. And I started reading it. Within an hour, I'd finished it. It mm. just absolutely engrossed me. And it was written by an astronomer. And he was looking at Stonehenge from an astronomer's perspective, not an archaeological perspective. Which is different, very different. Indeed. And he noticed, for example, that uh, there were certain uh, alignments that you can find within Stonehenge that only make sense up in the air. Mm. They don't make sense on the ground. And uh, if you wanted to kind of plot positions of stars or planets rising, it's really easy now because NASA would GPS the sky, right? Mm, yeah. But the way that one used to do it is a thing called azimuth, which means you use the horizon. Yeah. The problem with the horizon is it keeps changing because yeah. trees grow and stuff. 
And uh, here at 51 degrees north, although hinges and things might work, the problem is there's always cloud on, on the horizon. Yeah. Yes, yes. And so I mean, this country isn't isn't renowned for its blue skies, is it? <laughs> but my local news every year they say things like, "And uh, this morning, fifteen thousand people went into Stonehenge to watch the sunrise, but they're all disappointed because the sun came up above a cloud at eleven o'clock." Yeah, and that's just such a common thing mm. that it, like, British astronomy is just. Mm. Right. So, if you want to be able to pinpoint objects rising and falling on the sky the only thing you can do is build a false horizon up in the air mm. Mm -hmm. now on top of the lintels of Stonehenge oh, 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 yes. <laughs> they found some notches mm. and the notches indicate wooden posts mm. so now there were three choices there was either a built either a roof or yeah. that's a possibility could have been a roof there could have been another layer of structure made of wood yeah. That's a possibility, right? Or a handrail. Yeah. A handrail. Yeah. Now, if you think of an alignment, you might think of things in a line, right? So if you put one finger in front of you and then another finger between your nose and that finger, what you mm -hmm. find is the finger that's between the nose and the finger furthest away obscures the fingers furthest away. Yeah. yeah. But if you move them slightly to the side and you're looking through the gap, now suddenly you can look at something in alignment without it being obscure. Yeah, yeah. And inside Stonehenge, there are five what we call trilithons, which mm. are massive uprights with massive lintels. Mm. And when you look at these trilithons, they're not uniform. Mm. Uh, the inside, the side that faces inwards is smooth. The outside is rough hewn. Mm. Why? Why yeah, because I mean, why? whatever you do, it takes a huge amount of effort. So yeah, but why, not... but why, why do you make the inside smooth yeah. and get mm. about the back? Mm. As if that suggests that it's only the side that you view that's of interest. Yeah, yeah. Another thing is that when you look at these things, one side, one upright is that almost you know perfectly vertical. The other one has a sloping angle. Mm -hmm. What's the reason for that? What's the sloping angle for? Mm. So it seems as if, if you were on top of these, this circular of, lin of lintels and you looked across at the other side, what you'd find is that these big five things would jut above that and there would be gaps inside them that would have elevated angles. Mm. And that meant that if you were tracking the positions or plotting the, 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 uh, the, the, de the angle of declination of things as they rise, you could see almost like a shadow line when something would be absolutely on the mark. Mm. So that suggests that Stonehenge is an observatory that's made of stone. Yeah. Because that's in a material that won't decompose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it's their medium. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. I mean, it's one of the things that scientists have said for a long time is that that it's some sort of observatory but i haven't ever heard it explained as clearly as that no neither had i until i read this thing and i thought yeah. my God. so uh when i noticed through facebook a facebook friend of mine said he'd just done a an ma paper in um for this uh stonehenge archaeology at buckingham university mm. and I, I just uh got um accepted for a master of uh, science in psychology at mm. and then I saw this thing I thought ah oh. so I phoned up and I had a three-hour conversation with the professor running this thing and he said well you've got instant acceptance you know the the form is a formality and so I, I suddenly found myself kind of signed up for an MA <laughs> in ancient Britain <laughs> archaeology at the same time as having signed up for an MSc in psychology Keep you out of uh, and I think, how can I do two master's degrees at once? And then it turned out that the, the, the MA at Buckingham uh, got deferred because not enough people had signed up. And two miles from Stonehenge, there was what was once thought to be a hill fort. Mm. Uh, it's the place that uh, Julius Caesar's sergeant rested on his way to look for Stonehenge. Mm. So for a long time, it's been called Vespasian's Camp. Because mm. Vespasian stayed there. Mm. So... Um, uh, David Jakes from Buckingham University led a team to have a little bit of a rummage around and they found something absolutely astonishing. It turned out that this hill fort 
had a very long history going back 5,000 years prior to Stonehenge. So it's eight prior. So yeah. it's actually yes. not Roman. <laughs> no, no. So it's 8,000 BC, which is 10,000 years ago. Yeah. Mesolithic, which means it's Middle Stone Age. Yeah. And they found some astonishing things. One thing they found there was a lake. Mm-hmm. And in the lake, uh, there's some flint that has a pink hue. And you can scrape this pink stuff off. And, and that would become something you could use like clothing dye. Yeah. But when we think of our distant ancestors being all kind of, you know, macho and they're covered in blue woad, but our distant ancestors were running around wearing pink clothes. <laughs> but your reaction is the cultural. Of a pink. That, that's your, but that's your cultural reaction to it, right? Yeah, mm. absolutely. So, so, they, yeah. They, kept, so they, they decided to keep it absolutely secret because people might want to steal this stuff. Mm. So because the course was deferred, I was invited to go and have a look and spend the morning working on the site. Mm. And I had to go through three security cordons. They even took the, you know, the, the SD card out of my phone. Wow. Yeah. Seriously. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, seriously. You know, uh, you were checked and things. Um, and I was put on this kind of camp, you know, trowel fodder thing of mm. making buckets of mud from a trench. And then you have to kind of panhandle them through these like milk mm. crates with fine mesh at the bottom in water. Yeah. So I had this part of mud in my hand and as the mud faded away, what was left was this black piece of worked flint. And I was the first person to touch it for 6,000 years. That's stunning, and isn't it? That was, mm. I tell you, the tingles. And I managed to put it on the table and then I let go of it. <laughs> and then I stepped back and I left it on the table. It didn't go in my pocket. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know how. <laughs> It's the discipline to kind of mm. put it down and walk away. Yeah. Um, but it was astonishing just to be, to hold that, you know. Mm. What they also found at this place was a house, a building, a Mesolithic building, which would make it uh, only one of two Mesolithic buildings in the whole of Europe. Mm. Um, they got the carbon dating, and so it's now been demarked as the longest continuum community on the British Isles. Wow, so these sites have been, they've been in operation, mm. uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's yeah. and the what, bands of time are difficult to sort of get hold, hold what of. What they also found there was lots of bones of these very large prehistoric oxen called aurochs. Mm. So when the land bridge was still in place, you know, before, before we became separate from Europe. Between the uh, British Isles and Europe. Yeah, yeah. Mm. These, these aurochs were going on a migration path. And it mm. turned out that there was um, what was what used to be a dried up riverbed. So they would follow the track of the dried up riverbed. And the dried up riverbed was solstitially aligned. Mm-hmm. Mm. And along this dried up riverbed, there was a bit of rock that stood up like a promontory. Mm. Stand in this promontory and this wave of food would come towards you. And like a, like like water in the river meeting a stone would go around either side. Mm-hmm. You, could, you could pick them off. Right. And that promontory is where Stonehenge is now. Oh, gosh. So it's like, I mean, we, we see these migrations of, great migrations of wildebeest and things like this mm. in, uh, in Africa. So it's like one of those coming at you and you yeah. yeah, you're just up above it all and ping, ping, ping. This wave of food. So, so, wow. that, so that landscape would have been magic. Yeah, yeah. And in a... In a, a, a and, and, and we haven't even, I mean, we're, time is, we, we've, we've got a few minutes, but time is pushing on. But when you say the word magic, I say we haven't even, everything you're telling us is fascinating. We haven't even touched on uh, what a lot of people will have said, you know, are one of the things that, that oh, this is my, must be there. And that's earth energy lines and things like that. Yeah, well, I know we, we don't have time to go into that in great detail, but but that, that's another layer to it all, isn't it? Well, indeed. I mean, when when I do my tours, um, we well, follow, and you're you're sitting there in one of them at the moment. I, I <laughs> we, we, we we follow a main ley line from Avebury down through Stonehenge. Yeah, and um, I take people south of uh, Stonehenge to a place called Old Sarum, which is uh, a hill fort that has uh, occupation going back to when the land bridge broke. Yeah. And when you stand on Old Sarum and you look across the valley, across Salisbury, on the other side of the valley is another hill fort called Clearbury Ring. Mm. And Salisbury Cathedral is exactly in the middle. Yeah. 
And if you get a ruler that's 20 miles long and you line up those three points, it goes right through the middle of Stonehenge, right through the middle of West Kennet Long Barrow, right through the middle of Avery. Yeah. And, and one year, some, some very adventurous people, uh, we, we did this tour and we all had our swimming costumes with us. And we went through the New Forest and we followed the line to where it goes into the sea. We swam in the sea off the edge of the line. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's, I mean, the whole thing, the whole thing just speaks of intentionality at every level. Uh, and when you think that, as, as you've pointed out, when I mean, we have to try and get ourselves back into, you know, our, our ancestors' sort of mind, as it were, um, everywhere was covered in forests. There aren't the open fields and the sight lines and everything that we've got. Mm -hmm. um, there certainly weren't the maps or the instruments or anything like this. For them to do what they did, to know what they knew, to put together these amazing sites, I mean, well, you, I, you, you've, you've been living in this landscape for a long time. I, is there anything in all that time that sort of occurred to you about well, we know, we about know. how they're different to us now or what oh. they knew that we don't know? Oh, goodness me. That's, that's, that's another yeah, <laughs> conversation at least. But, but I mean, in, terms, in terms of like uh, sensing energies and things, I mean, you know, uh, a lot of our senses have become kind of unsalient now because of conscious awareness you know i would imagine our ancestors you know could smell their friends coming over the hill whereas only a dog can do it now you know yeah. mm. uh, we know that birds and fish seem to follow these electromagnetic energy lines which is how you know somehow a, a swallow can kind of fly to africa and come back to your garage and it's the same bird yeah yeah and, or how salmon find the same rock pool so I mean, that, that just you know if you just take a moment to even to think about that it's miraculous yeah. Well, well, it is, an, and yet it's perfectly natural to follow, you know, these lines you can detect. Mm. So, so that our ancestors could potentially detect or see or feel or, you know, sense in some way uh, these kind of energetic lines in the, in the ground. Um, yeah, I definitely think that they could have done, you know, uh, it mm. has potential. We can't, we, can't, we can't verify it, of course. That's the thing. Yeah. When, you, when you go into Avery... There's a professor of uh, history at Bristol University called Ronald Hutton. Mm. And he's considered to be uh, the foremost uh, uh, voice of understanding paganism or British paganism you know, in the world. And I saw him uh, walking around Avebury on TV with a journalist. And he said, Avebury, he said, Avebury is the theme park of the imagination. If you want warriors covered in blue paint waving tomahawks, you can have those. If you want priestesses dispensing healing for the sick and the needy, you can have those. If you want astrologers doing portents for the future, you can have those. You can have anything you want. Because we can look at what's left, but we don't know what they were thinking. And I often, when I'm walking around the landscape, mm. you get this feeling that you're kind of like a, a piece of dust passing through something that's permanent. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And I often say to people, if 3,000 years from now an archaeologist look back at our landscape, and they looked at, say, London. They mm. say, well, you know, here's High Grove Cemetery. There's a crack stone here. There's a wonky path there. This was a backwater of their civilization. But over here, there are thousands of white crosses in pristine roads. This was the height of their, their civilization, the utmost of their spirituality. Flanders fields mm. are the song were the best that they could be. Yeah. How easy is it to misread an entire culture by looking at their dead stuff? Absolutely. I'm mm. trying to say this dead stuff tells me about how they lived. Yeah. Mm. Right? It, you, you know, so, yeah. So we can get some glimmers, but to get inside exactly what they were thinking or understanding exactly what they were doing is impossible. But the, but the, the man hours it would have taken, mm. I mean, but the ditch and bank around Avery was originally, well, at its heyday, was three stories deep. Yeah, they had no tools, so that was dug out with goat shoulder blades and using deer antlers as pickaxes. And I saw one of those at, on the dig. At mm. uh, they opened up one of the ditches, they found a mini henge. Mm. And there was an original antler tool sticking out the chalk, and I saw it, and that was like tingle tingle. You know, that's 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 the only spade inverted commas that they had. And then I mean, you only have to uh, again. Um, just just think of the size of that. I mean, the size of the stones at Avery, they diminish you. 
mm. and the size of the stones at Stonehenge. Uh, I mean, you're, you're digging these enormous banks with with but, goat skeleton, skeleton, and 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 you are carving, moving. Or, or scraping. They, there has to be. I mean, all all it tells you, oh, and and uh, you know, you, you're you're so right. We we can only guess. Mm. We can only guess. I mean, the, there the, has to be. They had a good reason to do this because you don't just do this on a Sunday afternoon because you've got nothing. I, to. I know. I mean, if you think of um. You know, if the average lifespan was 30 years, yeah. then you'd be a 15-year-old middle-aged person. Yeah. And at the time that this stuff began, the, the whole of this island was, an, was awash with forest, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you've got to go up to a 15-year-old middle-aged man and say, excuse me, stop chasing rabbits and girls, go do this instead. But it's okay because we'll have people to grow your food, we'll have warriors to protect you, mm -hmm. warriors to protect the food growers. You have to have an organised society to do that, but one hell of a motivation of speaking. Absolutely, speak. because I mean these are these are generational logs. I, I know, I know. Generations I mean, to produce these sites, yeah. so the whole community has to be focused on an end game, and that end game has to be important for the community. Yeah, when I grew up, I, you know, there'd be Sunday afternoon films of Charlton Heston being the slave in Egypt and things. Yeah. Around two thousand and three, they found where the pyramid builders lived at the Giza Plateau. Mm. And they found the restaurants, they found the, uh, but also the hospital. Mm. There was a worker who'd had a broken arm and some splint work who was contemporary with a pharaoh who had a similar uh, problem. Mm. So they compared the surgery of the, the worker with the pharaoh, and the worker had better quality surgery than the king. Mm. Now, if you, if you have a slave population, you just throw them in a hole and get another one. Yeah. Mm. But the fact that this person was given high quality surgery must mean that they were valuable yes so archaeology uh, since 2003 has changed the narrative then mm. now what was happening was that there was some kind of communal collective vision mm. and that people would work in their villages for nine months a year and then go three months on project yeah so they'd kind of rotate around yeah yeah mm. so that's the only way that something could be done like that and that's that suggests a similar thing was happening here yeah so a lot of the um, the, the kind of the, 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 the visions of the New Age community of what in harmony, etc., was actually happening here. Yes. But yes, eight, these, these, thousand, these are examples of yeah. but, <laughs> what but, we aspire to. Yeah, but a long time ago, and in the Stonehenge landscape, uh, in what used to be the car park, in the old car park, there were three posts. Although we've, the word po when you hear the word post, you might think of a post that holds a garden fence. These things were like trees. Mm. And they could. We know that they were used as shadow lines to mark solstitial alignments, mm. and, and they're carbon dated Mesolithic. Yeah, which means that there were objects in the Stonehenge area that were being used to mark time, predating the pyramids by five thousand years. It's stunning. Predating the pyramids by five thousand mm. years, and that's under our feet. Yeah, and people drive over them, and they kind of walk around, and they don't know it's there. No. And people no. go to India and things to find spirituality. But there's a wealth of depth on it, the bones of this island. Absolutely. And it's actually one of the themes that's going to come out through this summit is that mm. uh, these lands um, have a lot to teach us. And we are really only just beginning to rediscover that, which is so exciting and so fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> and it is indeed. Doesn't yeah. it make you just want to stick around to find out what comes next? <laughs> well, I tell you, sleeping in it is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I, surprised you can yeah. sleep. I, I don't know if you noticed, uh, I, my, my current uh, Facebook cover photo is a picture I took this morning leaning out the window of the mm -hmm. sun coming up through a tree, which is just slightly to the left of Silbury Hill as yeah. I look at it. Mm. And, and I've been watching the sun get closer to Silbury over the last four months. Yeah. And there's a possibility, it's just a possibility, that on no one's Sunday morning when this goes out, if the sun touches the side of Silbury, yeah. from my house on that day. That means I live in a house that's aligned on the equinoxical axis to Silvery Hill. That's amazing. I, I, yeah. I feel very ha I'll be a happy boy. You've got your own little observatory going there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. David, I mean, we could talk and talk and talk because there is so, so, so much more to cover here. Um, but, uh, you know, we've run out of time, unfortunately. I hope we can come back and maybe have, you know, I mean, 
there, there's a, a wealth of things to talk about. So maybe at another stage we could do another talk. Can I just yeah. let people know? Yep. Mm -hmm. Once a year, I do a free tour. And I've been doing a free tour for a quarter of a century. And so if anyone's networked in with me, um, we'd spend seven hours uh, starting at April in the morning, and then we go around the Stonehenge landscape in the afternoon. And uh, I do a, you know, an in-depth talk on Stonehenge as well, while we sit by a tree looking at Stonehenge in the distance. And uh, I, I've been doing that free for such a long time because there are people who can't afford to do things, you know. But so yeah. just so that people can access to some information, yeah. have a nice day out with like-minded people. It's uh, yeah. Well, I know from talking with you previously that basically we were trying to condense into an hour. What is a fourteen-hour day? <laughs> So, so there's an awful lot more folks to learn about. So, uh, yeah, um, go to David's website um, uh, and go to Facebook and, and, and join him on Facebook if you want to keep in touch and find out when, when these things take place and be part of it. Mm. But in the meantime, David, I can't thank you enough for the time you've given us. It's been fascinating. Ah, oh, it's my hopefully, pleasure. Hopefully we'll have a rematch again at some stage. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Wonderful. And... For all of you listening, uh, I've got another wonderful speaker for you tomorrow to uh, amaze and delight you with some of the magic and mystery of Mother Earth. I shall see you again tomorrow. Goodbye.